myself and Surf Thomas here. Um, we're the founders of Tinker Growth, um, and we are looking forward to talking more about our story and, and really how we bring ideas to market. Um, at a high level, Tinker Growth is, is a venture studio um, that's really tailored for founders to create digital products and launch tech companies. Um, we were founded in 2016 and we were really committed to helping founders, mainly of diverse backgrounds, women and people of color, drive their mission and create me meaningful customer experiences while also building sustainable businesses. Keeping in mind three really essential sort of functions of a business, um, product strategy, product design, and product engineering. Um, who we are, we are a collective of entrepreneurs, founders, you know, myself, Surf as well, um, product architects, designers, and engineers who are all passionate about bringing ideas to market. Surf and I, we actually worked at PayPal and Venmo together. Um, we're also Techstars mentors. Um, Surf is also, uh, was, was, is also an engineer at Spotify. And then a few other members of our, of our team have worked at Uber and some, and some other Fortune 500 companies. Um, and at a high level, this is, this is our team. Um, you know, Leah and Gabby really oversee the strategy chapter, which is really thinking about sort of your market and customer sort of opportunities. When we think about design, Stephanie and Kayla are really there to help you think through your prototyping, your component library, and your overall product blueprint. Um, and then Gotham and Bo are, are really your, your, your geniuses when it comes to thinking of your architecture and your platform infrastructure. And ultimately how you bring your, your um, how you ultimately develop your product by putting code to actual screen. So a really important question here is, you know, wh why Tinker Growth and, and how did we get here? Um, and what we recognized was that through our founder journey and, and some of our peers and friends, um, particularly in the startup and venture ecosystem is that it's really hard for startups to get good advice, right? And we wanted to help founders at the early stage, particularly from the seed, at the seed stage to really level up from C to series A in a smart methodical manner by thinking through their product and technology. And the famous quote that we like to use is that everyone tells you what and why, but no one shows you how. And the reason why you work with Tinker, um, mainly Surf and I in our group is, like, is because we are your strategic advisors when it comes to your product and technology. And we wanna help you actually create meaningful experiences and build scalable technology. Our main goal is to provide the product design and engineering console that you need to better position your business and your brand for growth and scalability. So for us, we, we, we've built this very um, interesting playbook that, that, that helps founders think through their journey um, and their technology in a very smart and methodical manner, right? So before you even develop any sort of product, I think it's really, we think it's really important to think through your strategy. And what does that really mean, right? So one element of it is, is really your data understanding the qualitative and quantitative data. So what are your customers saying? What are they doing? How is the market behaving? How are your customers behaving across different business functions from sales to marketing, um, to product, finance, et cetera. And how do you leverage that Intel to develop uh, a KPI framework or key performance indicator framework to ultimately influence your product de design and development and, and how you think about, and then how you think about going to market and creating growth loops. The second element here is, is, when we th is what we call growth, right? So it's thinking of how do you build an ecosystem of different tools and, and tactics to help you ultimately acquire customers or, or retain um, customers, right? That ultimately drive your business outcomes from marketing to selling to communicating with your target audience. 
Um, and lastly, for, for strategy, it's really the UX. So, you know, we, we really want to teach you about, you know, what, what are the user missions and the customer pain points that you should ultimately be designing for? Um, and, and, and how do you do that in a way that clearly allows you to stack rank and understand your product and feature matrix before you even go into prototyping? I'm just going to take a pause there and, and, and get, a, get a gauge for if there are any questions um, from, the, from the audience. I was just going to ask, I'm so sorry. No worries. Uh, I'm, um, so I'm a statistician, so I work with the data. Nice. I don't know your terminology about KPI. When you say KPI, it doesn't mean anything to me. So when there's an abbreviation is going on, I would appreciate if you can tell it so that I can understand. Thank you. Sure. No, I thought I'd clarify, but um, KPI, key performance indicators. So what we, what does that mean? So it's really thinking about what are the, the metrics or data attributes that you ultimately want to measure that Thank drive you. your product or your I got it. business. And I think for the sake of this discussion, let's, let's hold questions to the end and um, Surf and I will be more than happy to address them. Um, the second chapter of our playbook is, is, is product design. So, you know, before you even, you know, think about building out any sort of mobile app or web, web platform or SaaS, we highly encourage our founders to prototype beforehand because one, we want to help you manage your resources and mitigate any sort of exposure so that you're not wasting um, resources on unnecessary designs or builds, right? And ultimately, you want to understand the customer needs in the business challenges before you go into full scale design and developing. Um, and when you do prototyping, this allows you to have that sort of discovery process, iterate on any sort of ideas or, or, or thoughts that you might have and really test um, you know, your, your thesis and, and some of your assumptions. The second element of design here is really blueprinting. So what are the, you know, what are the, how should you really think about, you know, the, the, the structure of the information across your, your product and, and what is the content strategy? So for instance, what we recognize is particularly our time at PayPal, um, you know, there were serious discoverability and comprehension issues due to the lack of how we structured and group our content. And we learned that that was negatively impacting our business from a customer acquisition lens as well as from a customer engagement lens. So what we wanna do is really help you think through at the blueprinting phase, how you structure your information in a way that drives user discovery, user comprehension, and user engagement, so that when you go into your design system phase, you have this very um, intuitive and, and thoughtful sort of blueprint to how you'd build out your component library, your UX, and your UI. Um, and it's something that's very, that's, that's, that's a common oversight for not only founders, but institutions um, of small, the mid, small and, and large sizes as well. Um, and the last, lastly here is system. So it's really thinking um, of your atomic sort of component library and how you build your UI and your technical, technical development that ultimately informs your engineering and software development. And I'm gonna kick it off to Surf to speak to the engineering chapter. Awesome. Uh, can everybody hear me? I'm gonna take that silence as hopefully yes. All right, cool, perfect. Um, so yeah, once we get into the engineering portion, which tends to always be the, everyone's favorite portion, right? Like they get to build something. But I think we step in kind of at the precursor level, right before the build, right? To make sure that you understand what and how you're going to build it, right? So we, 
we, we help with API design, understanding architecture, and we basically teach that in a fundamental way so that you can understand like, all right, cool, if we're gonna talk to a statistician or we're gonna be doing machine learning, like what does the data look like? What do the pipelines look like? Well, like what are the things that we're going to need to build? Because we think that comprehensively, regardless of if you're the C CEO or the CTO, right? You should be able to speak intelligently about your business, right? So that starts with flow diagramming, right? So that you can understand the structures of like, if we're building this feature, right? Like where is it supposed to go? Like, what is it supposed to do? Does it um, add information to the database here? Like, how do we actually graph, chart, and understand uh, the monolith or the company that we're going to be building on top of tech? And we do it through three layers, right? We do it through architecture, uh, so um, overall schematics and system designs, infrastructure, so understanding if we're going to be using um, containerized deployments, are we going to be using AWS, GCP, uh, et cetera, and then design. And when we, when, we, when we talk about design, we're actually talking about like flowchart diagramming, right? So like if a user hits this button through sign in, it hits this, this, and this server, it hits authentication, it hits... Um, it hits uh, our database, it hits all of these different pieces, et cetera. So really understanding the design of your system, right, of what you wanna build, so that even if you want to, let's say, take it to an outside source to have them develop, you have all of the artifacts and all of the knowledge that they really need to, uh, to, to have and kind of take in hand so that they can build and give you exactly what you want. Um, uh, next slide. Cool. Uh, back to Jay. Yeah, so more recently, we've, uh, we, we, we finalized a strategic partnership with Sprout Coding, um, which is a nonprofit that's helping to democratize computer science um, in, in Zimbabwe. So what we do is with our portfolio work, we, we essentially create curriculum, um, real world curriculum that we share with students to actually give them experience building startup companies and working directly with founders. And the idea here is for us to ultimately transform communities through code, but also create opportunities for students to, you know, either get a university scholarship or for older students to give them access to startup job opportunities. So this is something that we are really proud of and we want to highlight um, as we as we want to not only, um, you know, provide, you know, you know, resources and services to founders, but we also want to do it in a socially, social impact manner um, and actually help others. And lastly, I just want to clarify that when you're working with us, we aren't develop, designing or developing anything, right? We are solely helping you craft a, a business and product strategy so that when you are ready to actually execute, you can do it in a way that doesn't affect your, your resources and hurt your pockets. And you're doing it in a way that actually is scalable with your business over time, right? So at, at the final stage of our playbook or our program, we then help you by, by connecting you with venture partners that are either marketing specialists that work with Nike, that have worked with Google, that have industry knowledge that can actually help you think through the marketing tactics and that execution plan. If you need um, designers or mid to senior level developers, we can help you find them and you can actually hire them yourselves. And then lastly, you know, the founder journey is, is, is extremely, extremely, extremely hard, right? And, you know, we've, we've, we have experience, you know, by virtue of ourselves being founders and even friends of ours, you know, you know there's, there's challenges that they face on a day to day, whether they're personal, um, whether they're business related, um, and we ultimately want to make sure that our founders have the coaching and resources that they need to be mentally stable and healthy to actually drive their mission and build their companies. In short, um, you know, that's, that's Tinker Growth and, and we want to open the floor to, to the group here um, for, for any questions and for any founders, student founders that have any um, ideas that they want to bring to market. Surf and I are happy to have a conversation and, and share our thoughts with you. Thank you. And to, if you have a question, just go to the participants tab and there should be an option to raise your hand. 
I know that Yusuf has a question. Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jay and Surf. This is amazing. The uh, the social impact you're like targeting is really really cool and very meaningful. Like you're trying to uh, support people who can't have what everybody can have. So that's great, and thank you for that. My question is. Uh, about the business you you're having what is the business model for you yes for sure um, so there's there's a it's a hybrid model um, and, and it's and it's it's dependent on the founder and the stage of the company so typically for companies that we see in the seed stage um, they're either you know in that in the either have a family of friends family and friends round or they've you know they they have their first check you know, that's typically our sweet spot. Um, and that's where we, that's where our services can be really valuable um, as they have traction and enough data where they understand their customer in the market and they need that level of expertise to help them get to product market fit, right? To get to their series A round. Um, that's our sweet spot. And in and, and that model, it's really a SaaS. For earlier stage companies in the more pre-seed or if you will, you know, the idea stage, um, we typically do uh, equity share. Thank you. No worries. Um, it looks like Brandon has a question. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for uh, talking to us today. Um, I was just curious as my, my friend and I are actually have like a really early stage startup right now. And I was just wondering like from your experience working with companies in like the earliest stages like what are some of like the like the most common problems that you find like that they're running into that you've helped fix and like what are maybe some of like the biggest successes of getting from that early early stage to receiving your first check yeah for sure um i think most investors are going to tell you that um it's all about traction right and and failing fast um, but what we recognize, you know, our belief is that ultimately you should, you should understand what your customers want. So for an instance, Surf and I um, have built this AI visual commerce platform called Born. And it essentially allows users to discover products embedded in images and videos, very similar to Instagram shopping, right? Um, but across the broader internet. So at the, at the early stage, we had built this platform for influencer publishers. Um, and we felt that, you know, content is being created by influencers. They have the most, they have, they have you know, the, they have the market power. They, they have their content visibility. You know, that's the best inception point for our product, right? So we built this platform for, the, for these influencer publishers. But in the end, what we recognize is that, look, these influencer publishers don't have the bandwidth. And, and, and resources to create content at scale that actually drives our business forward. So we had to pivot, right? But ultimately those learnings and that data that we gathered from that exercise actually helped us iterate off our platform and product and build the right solution for the right customers, right? So now we're at the stage where we know our product serves you know, enterprise publishers, right? Like let's scale this, let's scale this up. So, to answer your question directly, I would say that, you know, get a prototype and gather as much intel from the market, from your customers, your target customers, and, and let them dictate how you build your, your product and your business forward. Uh, and then I, yeah, I want to chime in there um, as well. Um, I think Jay always hits the, the, the nail on the head and he brings up one of the hottest topics, I think, in all of, of the software engine uh, industry, which is fail fast, right? Everyone loves that concept of just like fail more, fail fast, right? But there's another layer to that, especially when you're talking about idea stage companies and seed companies where they don't have uh, a lot of the resources and a lot of the, um, the, the, the funding where, yeah, I, I think everyone should fail fast, right? And, and gather those learnings and use them. But really the moniker should be fail cheap, right? Because if you really think about your business, especially in the nascent stage, stages, right? Like the right failure will take you down, 
right? And I've been a part of many teams that have been have budgets that were big enough for them to stomach um, multi million dollar failures. I've seen multi million dollar, I'm talking one million to nine million dollar projects completely blow up, right? So it, it it it's it's really making sure that you understand your business so that you can take those learnings on the chin and they don't take you down. Um, I back to you, Jeff. No, that's a that's a great point. And and at the end of the day, the goal. I mean, at the early stage, it's all about survival, right? Like whatever it takes to survive, but, but also you have to be smart about that, right? And how you manage your resources, because as Surf said, at the early stage, like you don't have that much. So you have to make do with what you have and be smart. Thank you. And then a, a, a secondary piece on that too, right? It's like, I think that's why we, we, we leverage so much on the strategy side, right? Because it's like, the more you understand about what you're going to do, the more you can actually pick it apart and actually see these failures before they happen. And then you can actually negate them, right? Because it's just like, all right, cool. It's me, my co-founder, he's an engineer. We're just going to build some stuff and just work it out in our head. You'll find that you'll build this amazing tool that no one wants to use it, right? And then like, you spent all this time, I mean, ideally, it probably didn't cost you anything because you guys weren't paying each other, but like that time would have been better spent understanding what you were doing before you did anything in the first place. That's a great answer. Um, before the next person asks their question, um, could people, before they speak, just say one or two sentences about what their startup is or what their startup idea is? um so we have malavika next great one 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 second hannah i just brandon would you mind sharing your idea with us sure yeah i should have uh said that originally but my friend and i are working on a new startup called new sphere and the goal is to kind of help visualize and contextualize new stories because we feel like nowadays there's so much stuff going on yeah um, we do that through kind of an interactive timeline and right now it links to um, different websites that it'll show like a snippet of the story and links to the full website to, to view the full story. And yeah, that's what, that's what we're about. Newsphere. And do you have, cool. do you have a, a, a product built? Do you have a, you're an alpha beta. Have you gotten to that stage yet? Yeah. Right now we're like an, an open beta. So we had like a small um, beta group that we just made a Slack channel for and they all joined. Cool. And we just did it through like, Google forms had like a bunch of people sign up on um, like, I think it was Reddit. We did some Reddit and hacker news. Cool. And then from there we had them kind of provide feedback on the website. And then now it's open to the public. It's like you, it's free to create an account and we're still trying to gather um, kind of feedback and kind of back to um, Surfield's point. Um, like the strategy side, I feel like we probably could do more work on the strategy side. Because cool. we've been, my friend is the engineer, he's been doing most of the building. Cool. And um, I think we need to go back to working more on strategy to figure out who our target market is. So that's what we're working on right now. For sure. Yeah. Um, definitely feel free to reach out to us through tinkergrowth.com and we're happy to, you know, chat offline and, and, and work through your product strategy. I appreciate that. Cool. You don't have a clarification question. Um, could you just quickly say what alpha beta stage is? Uh, yeah. Um, so I think simply, you know, alpha is really, um, think of it as your proof of concept. It's like, you're almost like your MVP product um, that you actually put in market and get, I see someone moving. I think on. she said, what's MVP? Uh, MVP <laughs> is your most valuable product. So. It's the most basic minimum. version, uh, minimum valuable product, sorry. It's the most basic version of your product, right? Like what is something that you can scrap together like in a week and get out to market, right? Think of it that way. And then your beta is a more enhanced, more sophisticated version of that product that isn't quite ready for sort of, isn't quite ready to go to market, but has the, the bells and whistles for you to gain traction and, and actually grow your business. Yeah. And I think to, to help chime in there, uh, you can look at it as like phases of a build, right? So like the alpha might be the product that you give to like your friends and your family because you know it's a little bit wonky, but you just want to like test out, get some feedback, get some learning so that you can keep developing. The beta is the version of that where it's like, all right, now that you have your alpha out, 
uh, you're like, all right, these are the three features that everyone loves, right? So you want to box that up. You want to say, all right, I want to deploy this, get more users, get more understanding. And that's when it like moves into that beta stage. And it's just basically the value chain of like, as you build out a company, right? Over time, you're going to be building things and engineering and testing. So alpha is like, it's super, super early. We want to just test it with like the people who we know are going to give us feedback. Beta means like, all right, cool. We trust those people. We want to open it out a little bit more. And then you have like the V1s and the V2s, which is like, all right, cool. We trust this product. It's been tested. It's been uh, quality checked, et cetera. Uh, now we want to launch it out into the world. Cool. Uh, I think there was another question. Let me see if I can. Malavika has been waiting. Sorry about that, Malavika. Hi, Jay. Hi, Sophil. Thank you so much for the quick introduction for the for your company. Um, so I, I don't have a startup yet or uh, any MVP right now. I'm just in an exploratory stage of an idea that I had. Okay. Uh, and I don't have a team yet, too. But I just wanted to discuss about the idea that I had. Um, so uh, I was uh, reading a lot about uh, contact tracing and a lot of uh, problems that that could that the current apps have. And uh, I was just trying to think from a customer perspective uh, because a lot of contacts don't have a phone number and don't have a mobile phone because a lot of interactions these days are uh, having like it's it's basically it's there but the interaction is there but it's never logged or it's never having a contact yet. So I was just trying to see um, if there is any uh, new way of managing our new normal. Uh, which can help uh, families or individuals plan their interactions further. So I was just trying to understand, do you, uh, did you see any uh, trends in such, um, such ideas or thoughts uh, from your uh, company's perspective? Yes, I'm going to leave this to Surf, but just one clarifying question. Do you, are you speaking of contact tracing in the health, uh, in the health context or contact tracing and like more of like a data tracking customer Data uh, tracking, I, yeah. Okay, because uh, that's that's good to know. Um, sure, if you wanna you wanna take this or? Yeah, I could take this. Um, so we do have a partner that we have worked with that is a CDP platform that kind of handles this. So yes, we know that there is a market for it and a need for it. Um, uh, but when you say stuff like contact tracing, you're talking about an entire market, right? So it really depends on uh, like the specifics of like the silo or the niche you kind of want to get in. So I'll give you a perfect example. Um, one of our partners is, what's the name of the company, Jay? Imparticle. Imparticle, right? And they're a CDP platform that basically has an SDK or an API that a, a lot of top tier tech companies use to kind of stitch together their silo data and kind of like track and understand user funnels, right? So like from contact point one, which is like, you got this email, you clicked on the button, and now you're in the app experience. And then you click a whole bunch of other buttons, right? And then you like buy something, right? Most companies and most applications don't actually know how to track that user journey, right? So like they actually set up a company where they, where they handle that for you, right? So it's like from all of the different inception layers of your business, they can actually help you understand and, tr and, and trace those flows. Yeah. So from, from, from that um, side of it, yes, because they've created a multi-billion dollar business doing that but they're very very specific to helping businesses understand that so it really it really depends on like your specific silo like are you focused on health are you focused on news uh and again it doesn't mean that you can't go broader right but it's it it, it becomes very important especially if you find a niche market that really needs it that doesn't have it that might be your lane in to the industry and then you can start expanding as you become the dominant player in, in, in the market yeah and just to explain um, what a CDP is, a CDP is a customer data platform. And it, essentially what it does is it stitches your data together across different data silos to give you one universal profile of your, of your customer. So imagine you know, you're browsing Instagram and then you go to email and then you get a push notification, then you go to web what a customer data platform does, it stitches all those different user interactions to give you a comprehensive understanding of who that one individual is. Exactly. So it's not ideally the same thing as contact tracing, but we can take that, that, that common concept 
and use it for the same thing, right? Because like contact tracing is the concept, like specifically in healthcare of like understanding who a patient came in contact with. Yeah. Right? So it's like, but, th but if you think about the value chain of like you going to the hospital, right? You don't just walk into the hospital, someone treats you and they don't ask for any information, right? So like they want your insurance card, then you just sign all these forms, right? So like they know all the people that are assigned to your room, all of these things, right? So they might have the data. Yeah. It's just, they don't actually know how to access it and get at it in a way that they can actually find like all of the people who you've been in the vicinity around, right? But you could be the one building that platform and selling it to the hospital. Right. Uh, I was thinking more in terms of uh, uh, from the families and individuals perspective of managing their new normal, uh, maybe trying. So because a lot of times if people ask whom did you uh, interact with in the past seven days or uh, 14 days or in the past three days, it's so hard to remember uh, each of the details. Like it could be just a, a, a chit chat downstairs in your in your community. Uh, I mean, that, I mean, we don't, I mean, generally we might not even carry our mobile phone when we just go down to get a package. So these are all interactions, but uh, these do not get traced generally because we don't have a mobile phone or there's no internet connection, but individuals do remember they have gone down, right? So mm -hmm. I know it's like if user can enter this data, if user can log their own interactions to manage their own lives better, uh, would this problem can can this problem be solved is what uh, I was thinking, but I understand uh, when when we give the uh, right for the user to enter uh, or log their interactions, many people can forget it and many people uh, do not want to actually share information. So, uh, yeah, so it was just in an exploratory stage and I just wanted to make sure uh, this was something that could be workable or something. So, because I thought uh, in this way, uh, if you create a family uh, profile in the mobile app, then um, like, because uh, these days many families want to meet up or catch up, but then they're not sure whom their uh, family members have interacted or logged or, I mean, what's their status. So in, it just could give some increased insights into planning their own family gatherings or meetups. So, I mean, yeah, I was just uh, exploring those target market yeah. segments. Yeah, I, I, th think I think that's a good one. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of insider tidbit stuff. Don't go and uh, spread this knowledge, but I know that so to we're some extent. By the way, so. All right, so I'm gonna, yeah, all right, so we are recorded. Uh, don't share the recording, I guess. I'm just messing with you guys. Uh, but I have some friends at Google, and I know that they actually do um, some layers of contact tracing, especially if you're using things like the Google Maps app, right? So I think um, uh, it's not really privy knowledge for everyone to know, right? But like they actually use that to do things like congestions in cities, right? Like they actually know, like, how many cars are in a specific area at any specific time. Uh, so I would say extrapolate that and you can take those concepts and use that for um, your idea, right? So like, yes, there right. is the scenario where a user goes out without their phone, but like the way that we're all attached to our phones, like 90% of the use case are probably solved by like, let's, let, 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 let's first give them the inception and show them how many people they've come in contact with uh, just in their normal day, which is walking around with their phone, right? And that can be something as simple as an app that tracks GPS location, like most apps do, right? And like, yeah. uh, I'll give you a perfect example, right? Like I take a two hour walk every day, right? Uh, now that this is our new normal, I'm like, I need to get outside. I need to just like clear my head, right? I pass so yeah. many people in that walk, right? Like, and I don't know which one of them probably have a disease or are probably fine, right? But like, that's something that can be simply simple to track in an app. Like if I have the app and they all have the app, right? You can see how many people I've crossed paths with and then we can use that to build trajectories to say, hey, you come in contact with this person, go get checked out or whatever the situation. Is. Yeah, so. these are all Bluetooth or uh, GPS uh, enabled uh, uh, mobile apps, right? Exactly, yeah. yep. Which, which do it automatically, uh, not mm -hmm. from, uh, the user need not enter any information. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I thought maybe we can handle this problem from a different angle where the user himself or herself will be uh, putting in information. But I understand that could be having a lot of challenges uh, to face with. Yeah, one other thing I would add is just, you know, I would read up on GDPR um, or general data protection regulation, um, just so that you're compliant with how you're 
managing and distributing sort of customer information and any sort of privacy data um, before you go, you know, you, you, before you even consider sort of a prototype, right? Like just understand the, the market nuances, the competitive landscape and like the regulatory aspects before you even engage in any sort of prototyping or development. Right. Thank you so much for that. No problem at all. Didam, do you have a question? Well, actually, I have a question, but in order for me to ask the right question, I was looking at your guys' websites just to understand your business. Um, why I'm trying to understand, because I'm really valuing what you're putting. Yeah. Uh, however, I worked in a company uh, called Afinova in yeah. 2007. And we used to work with companies like Pepsi, Tropicana, Starbucks, all these companies, and they were trying to bring up I mean, you guys are mostly concentrated on startups, right? Correct. Yes. So on that sense, I really appreciate this is a really good business model. So I need to learn more information about you guys. But uh, that's why I need to look at your, I'm looking website, but I couldn't reach the information right away. I have to say it. I cannot understand what's going on when I look at it. It's beautifully made, but um, I, I need the sources mostly. Um, okay. this is like, please take it positively. I never do a criticism negatively. Um, I'm a data person. I'm, I'm coming from a scientific background. So I, I have lots of ideas how it can turn to startup or it may not, or it may help you guys. I don't care. I work for people. So, um, and when I did that work, it, it was marketing consulting company and we had, um, I work in the analytics part, which we were doing the model. There were two MIT guys actually build it. One of them, one of them is a system admin guy, genius. Um, the other person too. Um, I don't know what they're doing right now. Uh, right. I work partially because I was a student at that time. In visa uh, situations, I part-time worked. Um, Short-time work, I should say. Um, but I did all the analysis. So what the, pro what the business model is this, the Tropicana comes and says like, I want to add this product to my product line, but I don't know how successful it's gonna be, okay? So like give us the real feedback, what will happen based on the scenarios? So what product they should be designing and putting in the market. So imagine this from the, um, visual perspective, right? you know, everything. So we have architects, meaning like really from the art science major, who designs. So we put, put together all these information in a matrix form, and it's almost like a generic algorithm works on the behind, and we try to imitate the customer behavior online and come up with three optimal designs. Yep. We, did, we did this in 2007. Yep. Uh, and I don't know whether they're still doing it because I moved on. I'm working right now in <laughs> healthcare sciences. Yep. So, uh, but my point is that it was a very sophisticated model and it work, was working perfectly fine. Yep. So now I'm switching to you guys. So you guys giving yep. us yep. help for every idea, right? Say that, say, ask that question one more time. What was that question? So I'm just trying to understand your business model. So what you guys are actually doing is you're giving this opportunity to, to anybody who has the idea and saying that I have this idea, I want to put in a business model and how I can get help from you guys, right? Basically. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. And it depends at, it depends, depending on the stage of your idea. If you are, if this is an idea that you had in the shower last night, like you mm -hmm. can come to us, right? But if this is an idea that you've already developed and you're at that, pre-seed or seed stage, you can also come to us, right? So similar, you know, to your, I forget the name of the company that you previously worked with. Um, we, Afinova. Afinova. We don't, we don't focus the on- The idea company. Right. We don't, we don't do CPG. We're, we're strictly software focused, right? Um, and the reason why is because we are very technical and the data in the mythologies that we, I'm sorry to say it that way, but like what I mean by that, <laughs> what I mean by that is, you know, our, our research process is really rooted in sort of like understanding your data culture, right? So 
popping the hood of your business and going to every data silo and extrapolating that data to make sense of it to actually develop a product strategy, right? And then once we have that data, we understand what's happening. We then do customer journey mapping to understand across mm. the entire process from, from point A to point Z, what's happening, what are the gaps, what are the opportunities from either a product perspective, from a, from a brand positioning lens, or from a marketing and communication lens. And then also, you know, from, you know, a technology lens, so like what technology should you use to actually stitch these different interactions together? So it's really thinking of, it's literally thinking of your, the entire matrix of your business mm -hmm. and, and, and helping you develop a strategy and a design blueprint to actually develop the right solution. Okay, so on that side, oh, does that, Edom, um, one question, it's very important. One more question, data. okay. We uh, have uh, about the data. people speaking. I know, just the data about, because I'm really curious. So they take, we have to come as a customer with our data? No, you, well, you, it, it depends on your stage, right? So it depends if you have it, right? So if we're talking at the idea stage, you don't have any data, but yeah. then we'll shepherd you through the process of doing use, user research and actually acquiring some data to start making decisions about the business that you want to build, right? Because like, ideally, if we're talking about an idea, right, it doesn't start from like data. Like, we, like I, I think the perfect person would be Ariana, right? She said she's working on a, a dating app. She already did some qualitative research or she talked with PhDs um, from Brandeis about what the question and questions are. But ideally, she's at, I would say, the later stage of like, she already has her idea and she already has some semblance and she's already working at the build stage. So we can help there. But like, if she, if her, if she came into this and said, I have a concept for a dating idea and had like uh, uh, a two liner, right? Then we would start asking more questions and we would say, well, we need to validate this. We need to do re user research, right? And then we would set up user research studies, et cetera, et cetera, so that we get more of that qualitative and quantitative data to then start making more decisions on how we proceed and move forward, right? Because it doesn't mean that because you have an idea, we can help you, right? We might actually find out that the idea that you brought to us based on the research that we're all gonna do and, and, and talk about and learn together, that it's saying, hey, don't build this, you should build that, right? And then it right. funnels back up to them to make the decision if they're gonna stay their course or pivot. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That was awesome answer, thank you. No problem. Jacqueline Wang, do you have a question? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. So, hi, Jay. Hi, Serco. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm Jackie. Uh, um, I have an idea on building up a website or an app for job hunting for local community. And I am very early on my journey. I'm also only a rising sophomore. So really early. <laughs> I'm doing those um, because I'm a little bit late into this um, Zoom meeting because of something else. That's yeah, so um, I just have a few questions on, for example, how to attract um, users at the beginning, how to attract resources, how do I like collaborate with people, especially if I am an international student, I recognize that I cannot start a LLC and work at the same time. So what's like in general, your suggestion for me to get started and get involved and, you know, just like try to do something. Thank you. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think, I mean, I think your, your, your HR job, you know, opportunity platform, um, building a marketplace for, for um, talent or professionals to find new opportunities is interesting. And there are other players in the market that you can leverage to, to gather insights, right? So, you know, it's, it, it's what we would call sort of competitive analysis, right? So, you know, what is, you know, LinkedIn, you know, job posting doing? What is um, Indeed doing? You know, what are, what's, you know, Google jobs doing? And like, what are the gaps between those three different players that you can also really, uh, address and solve for? I think that could be a good starting point for you before you even go into any sort of um, design or development or any sort of business formation um, and really just understand the overall competitive landscape. I think that's a good starting point. Um, I, think, I think just interviewing, um, you know, talent and professionals about their job search and their 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 job hunting um you know what what are some things that they enjoyed what are some things that they found 
challenging? Um, you know, and how, you know, how do they get help from others? What do they find meaningful from some of these existing platforms? Um, I think that could be a good starting point. Um, and then also there's, there are a number of forms where people sort of share their, you know, reflections or feelings towards employers or, or, um, you know, different platforms that you can ultimately leverage to gather intel to build out your product strategy. Um, Sir, if anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I, I want to make sure that I uh, double down on what Jay said there. Like, I, I think a lot of people, when they get into the startup world, they get very, very gung-ho about like the business processes and like filling out all the paperwork, right? Uh, and we call that in uh, through just our overall time, uh, a lot of like paper pushing, right? <laughs> Which is like, all right, cool. I need to set up the LLC. I need to like get this bank account. I need to do all of these things. Right, but like at the end of the day, you might be a year or two years away from funding and maybe six months away from the users, right? So we always kind of think of it as the other approach, which is like uh, get the money in the bank before we really start thinking about a lot of like that whole processes and setup and don't use that as an impediment not to do anything, right? Because like technically you don't need an LLC to turn on a website, right? Like you can scrap together a website with some of your friends, hook it up to Stripe and start cooking with grease. I'm not saying start building now, right? Like there's still a lot of steps and processes before that, but like, don't let that get you discouraged to say that you, you can't start a business because uh, I don't know the, the specific minutia of your current situation, um, but I went to NJIT and there's a lot of H1, uh, I wanna make sure I think that. H1B. H1B visas. Uh, and a lot of those students are still uh, building applications, doing things with Stripe, starting companies, et cetera, et cetera. So don't really get super focused on like the nitty gritty and all of the construction, especially if you have the opportunity to build this business and get some users and get some money because then a lot of those problems are things that could be solved later down the road with the money in the bank. So. Yes, thank you. No problem at all. We have one final question from Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Hello. Uh, thank you for the really great presentation. Um, uh, this might not be in your area of expertise, I realize, but I have a small business. I just started selling my designs printed on notebooks and stickers. Cool. And I was wondering when you have a really art-based or design-based business, how do you, how would you, do you have any advice on how to stand out from other businesses and find your niche or find your customers? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a, well, congratulations, by the way. Um, I'm in market for a new moleskin, so happy to take a look at your, <laughs> your business. Um, <clears throat> I would say, I, I think, you know, one thing I, I, I recommend to, to founders and, and even, you know, friends of mine that have small, small businesses is to really think through sort of who your customer is or who, who, who are you, what your target audience is and, and where, where are they, right? What Wait, channel? Jay, I want to stop you there. Sorry. Just because it's not tech doesn't mean it's a small business. <laughs> well, sorry. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Coca-Cola is not a small business. Well, in this case, <laughs> uh, cool. or Amanda, uh, yes. th th this is how we work. We, we, we always tease each other. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so yeah, so I think you want to understand where your audience is and, and, and where channels they're on. Um, and quite frankly, I think, you know, we're, we're living in a world where the internet is amongst us and, you know, we're in the, we're, we're, we're in the face of, a, you know, industrial revolution around 4.0, which is really around connectivity. So, you know, we, we have platforms, we have channels, there's ways to connect with people in really meaningful ways. So, um, you know, I would say, you know, think about, you know, what your competitors are doing across other channels. Um, you know, there's platforms like Etsy and a lot of marketplaces that really champion um, designers and, and creatives like yourself. Um, so I would consider those to be really sort of, uh, you know, to, to help you create that network effect. So, I mean, I'm not going to say Amazon because, you know, there's, we, we have some, you know, personal thoughts there um, around, you know, <laughs> around their, they're kind of bullies in some ways, but uh, great platform, um, great way to find customers, but ultimately you got to be mindful of like how you want to share your data 
because once they catch wind, they, they leverage that to the best of their abilities, right? So that's the short version. Um, Etsy, though, is a really great platform for, you know, someone like yourself and is a really great way to connect with audience who are looking for bespoke designs and, you know, custom art and, and, and custom sort of products that way. Um, I would then also say, you know, you, you also want to own your brand and own your, your business. So although those are great channels to actually connect with audiences and co connect with audiences and drive product, um, you know, purchases, I would encourage you to, you know, think about building your own website and building out your own e-commerce platform so that you can start to own your customer data and, and really understand the inner workings of, of your business. Um, you know, that, that, in, that, in, that's pretty involved when it comes to sort of resourcing from a, from a design, from a development, um, you know, operation lens, but in the end, it's the best thing, you know, we surf and I feel it's the best thing for your personal business and brand. I'm sorry, man. I don't know if I answered your question directly. Was that helpful? Yeah, it was helpful. Thank you. Okay. So I think we have seven more minutes left. I'm, I, I'm, I still got some juice. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, let me, let me, let me just add one little tidbit of clarity on that one too. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the company Moon Cosmetics, uh, but it's a black female founder. I think she founded the company four years ago. And I think she did her first million dollar order. I think it was like three weeks ago and it was like super big news. So it, 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 uh, it doesn't mean that you can't grow and scale and turn a cosmetic company into something that's a really, really big behemoth. And I think the way that she went about um, doing that outreach is through, um, I think it was Instagram ads. So like she got um, Dream Dolls and I think um, other like famous people in the rap space and the music space to like look at her where she sent them products and prototypes. And again, like I'm not the marketer here. That's really Jay's forum, but I'm just saying, um, if you're talking about like trying to figure out specific tactics, I would say Instagram influencer That's type ad things. Like a lot of those things in that, in that, in that, in that space still really work. Um, I just know that I'm not the marketer here. So Jacob, no, that's a, you. That's a, thank you for that, sir. Because I just realized I did not answer a question. I think when it comes to growing sort of your business and audiences, it's thinking about your marketing mix, right? And there's three channels. There's, there's paid channels, there, there are social channels, and then there's earned channels, right? So when you think about paid channels, that's, that's the Google AdWords, the Bing ads, right? The Instagram posts, Facebook ads. When you think about earned channels, it's really, you know, you getting some sort of PR publicity piece and some blog or, or, or magazine that ultimately directs users to your website or your product pages. Right. And then the last one is, um, is owned, right. Which is your .com, your website or your SEO, um, search organic optimization, which I think is actually really important. Um, and then the way you drive sort of SEO is by creating content so that when users go to search Google or Bing, they're able to find sort of your brand, your platform content pieces around your products and actually engage with you in, in meaningful ways. So, um, to answer your question more directly, I would say, you know, think about your marketing mix and thinking about, think about the different channels um, you want to sort of focus on. It's going to be really hard for you to focus on all three. So think about the ones that um, get you closer to your audience and your, and your consumers or your customers and really focus on those. Um, we had, oh. was it, I, I hope that was more helpful than my original response <laughs> yeah. awesome we had yeah, one, one more question? question from yusef um <laughs> yusef do you want to ask your question yes uh thank you very much i started the questions and hopefully i'll end the questions i don't know maybe uh, so as a student or as a young professional what is the stage that we should be at before reaching out to you and what is the best way to reach out to you um, sorry, my, my cat decided to hijack us. Um, is she a partner? She is absolutely a partner. All my animals are, um, included surf. Um, just kidding. So I would say, you know, feel free to reach out to us, um, you know, at, at any stage. I think our business aside, we, we ultimately want to be a resource to, to founders, um, at, at, 
at any stage because if we aren't the guys, we have friends um, and we have a pretty rich network that we can ultimately gain, give you access to. Um, but I would say as it pertains directly to Tinker Growth, um, I would say, you know, the, the seed stage, like if, you, if you're at the pre-seed or the seed seed A stage, like please consider us and please reach out. Um, if you are even at the idea stage, you don't really know what to do. You know, we're happy to take, you know, have a phone call, have a conversation and, and share our knowledge. Um, and as I said before, either connect you to um, a friend or a venture partner or, or some sort of advisor of ours that might be able to guide you in a better way. Um, but, but Yusuf, I would say, you know, all of the above, um, but more directly, you know, the seed stage is Tinker Growth Sweet Spot. Um, can I share your email with people? What's the best way for people to connect with you? Uh, yeah, so our email is just J uh, insert, well, not J insert, J at tinkergrowth.com, surf at tinkergrowth.com. Um, and, you know, I think Hannah, it might be helpful to share our content information after the series with the, with the, with the group, um, including our LinkedIn and, um, and, you know, we can, we can go from there. And we're, again, we're happy to, you know, take phone calls, have conversations. Um, I want the school to think of us as a resource. Um, and, and as advocates for founders, student entrepreneurs on campus. Um, I remember my time on campus, I was, I've always been passionate about creating and building things. Um, and when I was on, on campus, I wasn't able to, um, I guess, you know, celebrate my, my entrepreneurial spirit. So if I can be a resource and a voice for, for students on campus or even um, professors, um, what have you, um, you know, I'm, I'm honored to do that. Definitely. Yeah, we would appreciate that. And you would be a great resource for the entrepreneurial community on campus. Thank um, well, thank you very much, Jay and Surf. Um, before I end this meeting, I just wanted to quickly mention one of the Brandeis Innovation Programs, Spark. A few people have been through it. Um, and I think Jacqueline and Amanda, especially, you guys might really find it helpful. Um, it's great for people who have ideas um, and maybe need a little direction. So we have um, training and opportunities for people to get funding through the SPARK program. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, and I'll see you guys next week. Cheers. Bye. Actually, we, may, we have a session tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, sorry, tomorrow with Christina. Thank you. Bye. Um, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Um, um you guys, guys uh, went well oh, you, you want you might want to stop the recording oh yes